Hey there, and welcome to another episode of Deeply Rooted. This is episode 87, and I'm Jeremiah Reiner, your host. Thank you guys for joining in for our brand new episode here. We're on the topic of spiritual gifts, actually, with Pastor Stephen Lester of Crossroads Church. But before we get into this, don't forget, head on over to our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcasts and make sure you hit that subscribe button and then leave us a review if you'd like to. You can also head on over and find us on our Facebook group page as well as our website, that's deeplyrootedpodcast.com. You can find all of our blog posts, archived episodes, and our upcoming ministry schedule is on there as well. So lots of things deeply rooted to dive into. And today's topic uh, is actually something that's come off of our Facebook group page. We ran a poll a couple of months back, uh, really for the fall sessions here, and we actually answered one of those recently, and this is our second most Uh, sought after topic and so we're going to be looking at the idea of spiritual gifts here again with Pastor Stephen Lester of Crossroads Church. So uh, Pastor Stephen, brother, thank you for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Appreciate you inviting me. Now this makes you a two-time episode guest so you're working your way up. Yeah, you're you're getting in there now so you're you're on your way to Hall of Fame. So uh, we appreciate you being on and thanks for for taking time out and um, we're just going to dive right into it, and as best we probably can to be informational, I guess, in the beginning, because I'm sure, you know, obviously when people wanted to hear this topic, they had questions, and that's great, and we want to help them out as best we can. So, you know, just right off the bat, um, could you just, I guess, briefly define what spiritual gifts are? You know, uh, spiritual gifts, uh, they're, they're just such a, a broad spectrum according to scripture, because we want to, of course, define everything according to scripture. Right. And, uh, and and according to scripture, um, they're, they're not, when, when you read Paul, when you read Peter, um, I don't think there's a, a, um, a set number. There, there's quite a few gifts. Um, and there's, uh, possibly many gifts that are not even mentioned right. in, the, in the canon. And so my definition, what are spiritual gifts? So so let's let's take it gifts and spiritual gifts. Yeah. Okay, uh, e- even the word obviously people have gifts. We go to concerts and we listen to people's vocal gifts. We listen to people's talents in terms of playing the piano. We we look at people's natural abilities. We look at people's talents. We look at whether it's God given, just naturally born, an inclination to do certain things, or whether they have a desire and drive and they develop certain um, certain talents, certain um, certain um, uh, uh, things, um, learnings, uh, music, writing, wh- whatever it would be. Um, so I believe. A natural-born talent, whether a talent is um, cultivated um, for playing the guitar or whatever, whether it's a spontaneous, sudden uh, impulse of mercy or kindness or faith, um, or whether one is providentially called into an area. Uh, I've heard some people say, well, you know, I ain't been able to teach. I don't like teach. I can't stand up in front of people, but God called me in this area. And then I went to school and now, you know, they get up and they teach and they're operating in that particular gift. So what spiritual gifts are, um, is a, is a, is a talent, is an ability, um, is a character trait, is a, um, a grace. So I, I would say all of them that are gifts. But the other word I want to mention is spiritual. Right. They're they're used for a spiritual purpose in a spiritual context. Because you can go listen to Lady Gaga and you ain't gonna get no spiritual benefit from it. Right. Even though she may be talented and have gifts. And so spiritual gifts would be talents, uh, abilities. Um, impulses, character traits that are used in the context of uh, spirituality, particularly 
uh, for us knowing God and learning about Christ. Right. Now, you, you did a good job there mentioning that Paul and, and Peter both wrote about these. Just as a follow-up there, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 mm-hmm. Peter 4. It's kind of easy to remember 12, 12, 4, and 4. Yeah, that's, that's all the scriptures I yeah. got off. Um, is really the, the go-to passages, like you said, yeah. if, if you want to dive in. And and I don't think for sake of time we're going to break down each individual one because right. like you said we could spend forever on this and even talk about things that may or may not be on that list. Right. Because you have to remember, Paul wrote to three different churches there, and mm-hmm. he did not mention the same ones over and over repetitively. So there is something to take away from that. Peter, yes, mentioned some of the same ones Paul did, but not all. So we don't want to get into this like tug of war on these spiritual gifts versus these different books. But we do understand that, like you said, they serve a spiritual purpose. Um, And I think you identified that really well, that these are not just natural talents, like someone can hit a baseball or they can sing on key. Um, These are things that are Um, Mm -hmm. God-honoring. They are, in essence, they are extremely spiritual-minded in other words, yeah. like you said, like this is not of just the natural sense. They carry significant eternal weight in what we've gotten them from. So the other follow-up question I want to hit on here is, and I think this is a common one that I hear from a lot of people, and rightfully so, I think this is a good question, but how do you think we can identify, or maybe a better word is like confirm these gifts in our own life? First of all, is is no um, from scripture um, what the uh, what a, a general picture of the gifts are. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, a gift would be in the sphere of the fruit of the spirit, and so um, so anything that would. Um, First of all, how I identify a spiritual gift in a person. It's what they love to do. It's what they're good at. It's what their what their 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 natural disposition is almost. Now whether that's from birth, you know, God can certainly give gifts uh people from birth and, and you know they're just naturally good at something or naturally um um dispositioned in, in a character type of way of, for patience or kindness or, or, or whatever, mercy, or whether they're born into a rich family and God saves them and, and sanctifies all of their wealth and they have a spirit of giving, you right. know, that, that's certainly a spiritual gift. So whether like Joseph, just an organizational mind, yeah. you know, just, just naturally gifted in discipline and organization. And so first of all, what, what, what are you good at? You know, are you, I've heard, I've heard people, people say, I wish God had, you know, blessed me with singing or, or done this. I just don't have any spiritual gifts. And I look at that person. I'm like, you're the most organized person I've ever known. That is a gift. Mm -hmm. That's what Joseph had. Just a very disciplined, organized person. God can use that for his glory. And so what are you good at? What do you like to do? What are you drawn to? Um, um, you know, some people, they're not naturally good um, musicians, but yet they're drawn to that. They love it, and they practice and practice and practice, and God blesses them, and then they honor God with their musical gifts, you know. And so um, to identify, we want to know from Scripture the general uh, uh, skeleton of what the spiritual gifts are. And then then we have to look subjectively what are we good at? What do we love? What are we drawn to? And then we can honor God in those areas. Yeah. How do you think the local church, uh, pastors, church leaders, elders, deacons, however you want to phrase that, can help believers grow and exercise those gifts? I, I think teaching from Scripture, Yeah. definitely. Um a lot of times you can draw from the Old Testament spiritual gifts and, and you can do a character study of, say, Abraham or Joseph, and, and you can highlight uh, spiritual gifts in their life. You can highlight faith. Um, but most definitely when you do a, a, a good teaching 
uh, rightfully discerning the word and, and just drawing out that good marrow of the word of spiritual gifts, not only not only uh, say say wisdom, you know, wisdom is a spiritual gift, but when you can put that in a broader context of why do you have wisdom as a spiritual gift, and that is to upbuild the body of Christ, and that's not it's not in a vacuum. It is it is for um, the overall purposes of God, and that is redeeming the world in Christ Jesus. And so you cannot, and so many people, they divorce um, the spiritual gifts from the overall purpose of God in Christ Jesus. And it's almost like a little a little um, religion of itself, you know, the spiritual gifts, and they're so consumed and focused on spiritual gifts. Well, right. you can't have the spiritual gifts without um, the broader purpose, and that is the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think, you know, making sure you teach it correctly is is definitely priority number one so that people don't get off track. And, you know, I think good leadership in a church, which, again, is, you know, partial uh, spiritual gift there, but just giving opportunity yeah, that's to exercise. Good. You know, like there, there are many people within most churches that are very good at hospitality and mm-hmm. that are better sometimes than even some of your best leadership. And giving those people opportunity to organize that and and make sure that they're exercising their gift. Like you mentioned, generosity. Are you giving people opportunity to do that? People, you know, have a heart to do that. You'd be shocked that there are people out there that just really want to donate and give, you know, as the Bible says, cheerfully. Yeah. And and they take um, a lot of spiritual pride in that, not in a negative way, but in a good spiritual way. they, They understand that, hey, God has blessed me with this. And it is my duty to give. And I think the Lord's, yeah. you know, prepared me to do that. So, yeah, definitely making sure people understand it from the Bible and then ultimately making sure you give people the opportunity to exercise it. And one thing, and you probably echo this as well, especially as a minister, encouraging people when they yeah. do exercise it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've preached enough bad messages to know but I, the ones that I remember are when somebody came along and and said, hey, you know, that, that was really good. You were in the text. I learned from that. I think God was glorified. And you need to keep it up. You know, yeah. I remember people like that, that the world would never know, a, a, you know, from a million people. But just exercising and affirming people when they do exercise it well. Um, yeah. And I think that's a big reason, you know, some churches may or may not see more people exercise their call. I I just, I wonder sometimes if we are affirming some of these people in their gift and making sure we encourage them. Again, you know, hospitality and generosity are on the same page. (laughs) Um, And you don't need to glorify the the generous giver any more than you do the person that's putting on a, a good Sunday afternoon meal or having people over and you know, leading Bible studies and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that's a big part of, of local church growth is affirming and supporting people in their spiritual gift and making sure that they know that they're welcomed and they're appreciated. And at the same time, they are within their biblical bounds and doing what I think God's called them to do. So um, let's shift yeah. gears here for a second, because this is the one where I I think more people may have some questions on. But so we sort of talked about what spiritual gifts are, um, how you can exercise that. And again, I highly encourage people listening, please go back to those passages and read them for yourself. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. But I want to, like I said, transition here and talk a little bit about what spiritual gifts are not. <laughs> and and sometimes I think this might be the real topic that, that needs to be hit on, but... Um, and and I'll just start off with this question. Do you think there's any attributes in somebody's life that sometimes we mistakenly identify as a spiritual gift when the Bible clearly does not call it that? I do. Um, I think a lot of times when you don't have an organic, real, down-to-earth church that like you said encourages one another just common uh encourages one another in the in the lesser 
what what people view as the lesser you know gifts as sure. far as hospitality and those type of things. But when you can magnify those gifts and and, and really put a premium on on kindness and hospitality and generosity, um, that helps. What when you have a church that's performance driven, mm. um, a lot of times. Um, when a person speaks well or can turn a phrase or yeah. can preach really well, I don't, uh, probably not even preach is the right word. When a person can communicate really well um, or sing really well or perform really well, that many times is mistaken for a spiritual gift. Yeah. And it may not be. It just clearly may not be a spiritual gift. Yeah, I think you in in the very beginning when you mentioned the fact that you need to identify gift and then the word spiritual, and I and I'll, yeah. I'll go back to that because I think in my mind a lot of times, I think we get the word talent and gift confused. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have talent and not be born again. Absolutely. Um, you know, you and I were talking before we got on the air. I was watching a baseball game and a gentleman led off the World Series with a home run. I have no idea if he knows Christ. But I do know that he can hit. Um, <laughs> that's talent. He has a legitimate talent to do that. Like you mentioned, there are people that are ultra talented in music and the arts and public speaking. Um, I know people in my profession that could teach circles around me, but are also lost. Yeah. Um, that is a talent that they have. That is not a spiritual gift. They could not open the Bible and accurately handle the text. Right. As Paul said, they could not rightly divide. You know, they, they would not have that ability. So, yeah, I think you're tracking really well there that, that we don't get talents confused with spiritual gifts. Again, one is probably just simply for your benefit. Mm-hmm. A spiritual gift, nine times out of ten, doesn't benefit you at all very rarely, but it will benefit the body of Christ, and it will glorify the Lord. Yeah. And I think there will be great joy for you in that. Uh, but it's usually more of the service that you have for the Lord in the spiritual gift as opposed to with a talent. That might be your means of income and popularity and, and Lord knows what else that comes along with that. So, yeah, we don't want to get those two confused for sure. Um, here's a good follow-up question. Um, do you think some gifts are gender-specific? I do. Okay. Um, I think teaching Okay. To the to the church, right? Um, you know, obviously the office of uh, of eldership. Yeah, I think that that is gender specific, and um, any any type of uh, authoritative position, um, I think that that most likely that that gift would be more suited to a man in in the biblical uh, setting. So you would um, you would frame that elder pastor sermon. elder pastor yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, preacher I, I think, Bible teacher right yeah, yeah. right Bible teacher um, preacher pastor elder I think those gifts that fall along and also um, uh, you know I, I think we ought to uh, if a person there's a, there's an element of discernment which is also a spiritual gift that one needs to use right. Um, among you know, you you don't want uh, a man uh, just say, well, you know, I I have the gift of of compassion, and I and I want to go to the houses of these widows and wash their feet. You know, that just not, right. <laughs> you, you want you want to be careful about stuff like that. You want sure. to use some some wisdom and and vice versa with um, with a woman, and so. Yes, there are some gifts that are gender specific, and yes, we must use gender awareness with uh, with gifts. Yeah, and I think that goes right back to what you said when when you mentioned, you know, how do we kind of confirm these? Well, the scriptures, you know, we, that's the first way that we help people understand, and I think that's a good place to start. So I would definitely agree with you there on the gender specific. Um, another question to that: Do you think there are some that are sort of age or maybe maturity specific maybe that's a better way to frame it i i do as well i think i think being an elder mm-hmm. the, not not necessarily 
you know, that, that may be more of a, a maturity uh, specific type. Sure. Of course, a lot of times age and, and, and being mature in the Lord kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, not all the time. But um, certainly, I think Paul qualifies eldership not being a novice. Sure. And so, so one has to be uh, mature in the faith. And then and there are some gifts that are that are so delicate of nature and so that carry so much authority and so much weight in terms of, of setting in judgment and using wisdom and, and, and various things. And even if God would, would so want to use somebody in, in uh, um, maybe just an unusual way that you wouldn't think of, I mean, you would have to have a level of maturity in the Lord to know how to do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think you know, just as an illustration, like for example, if a forty-year-old man who is a gifted communicator, maybe in the office, and he's done a great job for years, but he's converted, you know, I don't necessarily believe it's a great idea to throw him in to lead Sunday school next Sunday, right. just because again he's a great communicator. Like you said, we don't want to give that office to a novice. Right. And and you mentioned a good point. Yeah, more often than not, it spiritual age and and you know, physical age do sort of go hand in hand, but there are those exceptions where people are saved later in life. And, you know, Paul is a good example, mm-hmm. was saved later in his life. And so the scripture talks about he went away for a while um, and had to mature as a believer and had to grow up, so to speak, before he was ever handed over any kind of assignment from the Lord, even uh, much less the apostles in the early church. So yeah, that's a great point there that, you know, there there is some, as you said, discernment on age and maturity that we need to be cautious about. But again, you know, I want to drive that point home that you've already made. Um, go to the text. Understand yeah. that, you know, what is a, a, a better application here just because somebody does have a gift? Are they ready to use that? Are, are we throwing them out there too early? And, uh, and when we do throw them out there for this, let's get behind them. You know, because they're going to be new, just like we all were new when we first started, whatever it was that the Lord gifted us to do. So, yeah, that's a great point there. Um, You and I talked about before we come on here, I jokingly said we were talking about a a mutual friend of ours, and uh, I told him that I was having you on, and uh, I told him the topic, and he said, oh, that's uh, that's great. And uh, he said, you know, he comes from a, a Pentecostal background. And I said, yeah, that's why I picked him. <laughs> yeah. um, and I want to touch on that for just a moment. Um, and you you feel free if you want to share your testimony. That's fine, too. Uh, you just, mm-hmm. however you feel led to talk about this. But do you think there there's any other topic in the Bible that's been more hijacked than spiritual gifts? Oh, wow. Yeah, coming from a Pentecostal background, not only not only classic Pentecostalism, but you know, branching out into the, a lot of the charismatic word of faith. Uh, so I'm very, very, very familiar with with that. In fact, I've had a lot of people that are now just no longer you really deal with me that much because I've left that uh, good people, good people in the church. Right. But some of the contentions that I have specifically, I mean, there's, there's quite a few, but specifically has to do with, with the spiritual gifts. And and when you, when you talk about spiritual gifts in a Pentecostal or charismatic church, and please don't, I don't want to try to, um, uh, you know, do a straw man and, and and say that they're all like this. Right. But you know, a general looking on television with Bethel and and just um, uh, IHOP and and uh, Rod Parsley and yeah, a lot of those uh, Pentecostals charismatics. Uh, you're you're talk you're going to talk about prophecy. You're going to talk about the office of apostles. You're going to talk about tongues and interpretations. Yeah. You're going to talk about discernment of spirits. You know, forget just being kind or the gift of generosity or, or the gift of any of these other, uh, what they would view as lesser gifts. No, sure. we want to concentrate on prophecy. And so they've kind of taken that very uh, contentious 
um, part, and, and, and they've magnified that. And many times that is the gospel to them. That's how they preach. Yeah. They prophesy. They, they, they speak in tongues over people. And, and so to go into a charismatic church, Pentecostal service, you're going to have speaking in tongues. You're going to have prophecy. You're going to have interpretation. And that's what they view as uh, spiritual gifts. Now, um, I, you know, I don't want to get into real in depth, but um, it is my belief uh, from the text, from the scriptures, that specifically prophecy, tongues, interpretation, office of apostle, um, um, that was, you know, a jump start to the early church. Um, uh, when you go into, uh, you know, what's being manifest now, what's being touted as spiritual gifts, those are not spiritual gifts. Though, though they have been, they have been corrupted. They've been hijacked. They've been falsely taught. It's uh, more of a, a emotionalism, sensationism, and it, and it and it's been uh, labeled as the gospel, and and it's not. I right. came out of that church. Uh, there was a heavy focus on that. And it is, um, it blinds, it shades, it covers up the true gospel, and um, it just, um, it's 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 sad uh, that that's that's what's happened. Yeah, I want to touch on that because you you made some really good valid points there and brought up a lot that, to unpack. Um, you know, I'll reiterate what you said, just so in case anybody's listening. You know, we both have good friends, saved friends yes. that are still in the Pentecostal, the charismatic movement. I would never doubt their salvation. I don't think right. you would either. We would disagree on these, and um, and I'll leave it at that, and that's okay. I'm not going to yeah. break fellowship with some of these people for that. Um, you know, we, we can have some strong discussions, and that's perfectly fine. But I just, you know, I think you would agree. I'm, I'm not sitting here questioning somebody's salvation right. on some of these. Now, are there some that have went too far and I believed have, you know, followed in the line of heresy? Yeah, sure, I do. Yeah. I, I do think people have taken it too far. You made some mention of some of those groups, um, and I do think they need to be mentioned. Bethel. Uh, your your Rod Parsley's, your Kenneth Copeland's, your Jesse Duplantis, your people yeah. that, you know, let's just call a spade a spade, have went off the rails, and they are unbiblical in the way that they do interpret Scripture and the way they define the gospel or probably don't define the gospel. Um, and I do think that that needs to be called out. Um, I think Scripture is clear that we should call them out. Um, yeah. When you see wolves in sheep's clothing, it's pretty obvious um, that, yeah. that there needs to be something said. Um, having said that, um, I want to define two words here for our audience, um, especially those that may not be big in the theological world. And I understand that completely. You know, I, you know, uh, growing up, these were not words that I heard a lot. But could you briefly touch on the difference between what is referred to as a continuationist versus a cessationist? Right. So a continuationist is, to break it down, is a person that believes that all of the uh, New Testament norms in terms of the healings uh, like Jesus did, like Peter did, like Paul did, should be normative in the church today. Right, the apostolic That's a key gives, word, yeah. normative. yeah. Um, and when we saw when we saw Jesus and we saw Peter and the apostles, it was a norm every day that miracles of beyond. Um, I mean, they, they were validated miracles. Right, um, happened every day. That was the normative. A continuationist believes that those type of miracles, that prophecy. That tongues, and I'm not talking about gibberish. I'm not talking about a syllable. I'm talking about a legitimate tongue, right. a foreign language that is not known to the person. Uh, that that content should be a norm in the church today. That we should have prophecy. That we should have um, 
uh, the healings, that we should have the manifestations and the miracles like the time of Christ. Um, and not to I, cut you off too hard, but, you know, there are larger sections of these charismatic Pentecostal groups and some outside of that that would even argue this is the manifestation of your salvation. It's true. Almost as if this is the proving sign, you know, um, you and know, so they have taken it that far in some places. Yeah, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit right. with the evidence exactly. of the speaking with the other tongues. Um, uh, but, but all throughout Scripture, whenever God validates His revelation, He always does it with signs and miracles. And there's revelatory periods with Moses, and then you have the great outpouring of miracles with Moses, and then you have the prophets, and then you have the great outpouring of miracles with Elijah and Elisha. And then you have Christ and the apostles, the great outpouring of miracles. Those were revelatory times. Right. You have hundreds of years where there is not a drop of a miracle sure. that ever happens. And, and so uh, to say the Bible is a book of miracles is true, a prophecy and, and so on and so forth, but it's during revelatory times. Right. It's not a, continue, a continuation. And so a, continuous would, a continuationist would believe that those miracles, signs, prophecy, tongues— like I said, non-gibberish, tongues, interpretation of those tongues should be normative for the church today. It is not. It is not a normative. I mean, you can glance. People, they're not walking into hospitals and they're shadow healing people. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So a cessationist would believe that the normative miracles and signs and prophecies and so on and so forth depicted in the Gospels in the book of Acts um, has served its purpose, and that is to confirm the revelation. Right. It is not to say that God doesn't work today. It is not to say that God doesn't heal. He absolutely can heal. He absolutely can do anything that he wants to, but to say that it's norm and that we should expect that every single day um, um, as a gift or as a, like Paul or Peter, or we should do the acts of the apostles, um, I would say no. And the reason I would say no is because that is the pattern of Scripture. We have the Word. The Word is sufficient. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the spiritual gifts. And it is just not, um, that. that's what a cessationist would, would believe. Right. And so those are the two. And I think the key word is normative. Yeah. God is not working normatively in in tongues, interpretation, prophecy, healing, and all that. Uh, not to say that he can't or that he won't, but it just it's just not not yeah. normative. And again, like to follow up like what you mentioned there, a cessationist would simply teach the reason for that is because we have the scriptures. We have the scriptures. Right. Inspired by literally the Holy Spirit. You know, God breathed. We can talk about that another session. But, you know, that that would be where they would fall in line, that these are not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. And like you said, not normative in today's church because, again, such a high view of the scripture, the power of the word of God. Um, and the Holy Spirit itself working through that. So that's a good job there explaining that. Um, picking back up, you know, with that, this hijacking, so to speak, and because, again, we all know the horror stories, and I'm sure especially in this area in the Bible Belt, we've seen a lot, and I think many people could probably email us and give us some really bad ones, But and you and I could share plenty of them all night. But who... If we if we really had to pinpoint this down, so to speak, into maybe a couple of groups, certainly the blame is shifted to Satan. I don't think anybody would debate that. I mean, here's the father of lies, and that's what he does. He lies to divide the body of Christ. And But if we had to go further, like, where would we put some blame on this whole hijacking of spiritual gifts? Charles Finney. Okay. <laughs> I... Uh, the second great awakening. Okay. I think, when, when, out of that, you come. You got the the Azusa. You got you got a lot of a lot of um, false teachers, really, right. that that are coming up, um, and um, uh, misleading people. 
And, and how they mislead people is they're drawing the attention away from the gospel and focusing on signs and miracles. Yeah. And and so then then you have an, a revival of emotionalism. And whenever you have a revival of emotionalism, it's it's going to it's going to um, concentrate on your your miracles, your your extraordinary yeah. gifts, your your extraordinary things. So so those teachers and the, those streams of movements from Finney, and then you got uh, John G. Lake, and then you've got Amy Simple McPherson, yeah. and then you've got. Smith Wigglesworth, and then you've got all the outshoots, and the, and this this area is saturated sure. with 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 uh, the the children from from that movement, and it has blinded the gospel. Uh, people people know about prophecy, tongues, interpretations, but they don't know about justification by faith. Yeah. that that there you go. There's when you there's more of an emphasis on prophecy and speaking with other tongues. And you know more about that than you know about the atonement and the justification um, by faith, then there is a major problem. I've and always, I feel that it's it. I've always landed on this, I guess, opinion, so to speak. And you correct me, debate me, whatever you like to do. But um, it, it has always seemed to me, people that have the major emphasis on the spiritual gifts over the justification by faith alone, it's almost as if it's a works-based salvation. Mm. Like, I would I would have to make a strong argument in that case saying that basically you're almost trying to make it out as if Christ's death, burial, resurrection is not sufficient. And I think that's dangerous ground to get on when you begin to think that way and saying, yes, salvation by faith alone, plus, and you can start filling in the blanks in all these areas. To that, you know, we can go down a rabbit trail. Obviously, the the emotionalism, the, the sensational type preaching and revivalism, like you mentioned from Finney that swept through the 1800s there in the Second Great Awakening and it's spread all throughout the world, not just in this area, but the United mm-hmm. States has sent missionaries far and wide with this type of belief. And you can see the results, Latin America, Africa. I mean, it's it's been detrimental, to say the least. Um, but I just can't help but think, I, I go back to this idea, it, it's almost a works-based type gospel that, yes, you're born again, but you must prove this by, you know, X, Y, and Z, on top of the finished work of Jesus, which I just think is, I mean, I don't know any other way to put that, but blasphemy. I mean, it's, it's almost heretical to teach that, but I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but I mean, that's sort of the way I've sort of, you know, when you see scripture, I believe that's a a proper interpretation of that. Well, when you, when you have, when you have, um, um, it may not be a direct teaching, but it is the atmosphere when you have somebody that operates, quote unquote, in the spiritual gifts, meaning that they speak in tongues, they prophesy, they they uh, are very sensational, they're very loud, they're very emotional. That is your super Christians. Sure, those are the super Christians, and those are what you aspire to. Don't be one of these poor people that just believe Jesus saved you from your sins. I mean, that's, you know, that's just the base, the mundane, you know. And how wrong is that? I mean, sure. like you said, it's almost a default to works based. You got to add to your faith this and this work and this gift and this gifts before you reach a certain level of. Uh, perfectionism and some denominations te- actually that's how they teach um but um uh, i agree with you 100 percent that 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 defaults back to a works based yeah. religion because the emphasis the, the emphasis is upon works it's upon emotionalism it's on sensationalism it is not upon something outside of ourselves, which is the finished work of jesus yeah. christ yeah, a, a passage that always rings in my head. I've, I've taught this before going through the book of Jonah, but there's a passage there in the Gospels where Jesus is confronted 
with a group of people that keep basically demanding a sign from him. They they want something supernatural, not for any other reason than just for their sheer unbelief. Yeah. And he makes a very strong, poignant statement and when he says, an evil and adulterous generation demand a sign. Absolutely. And I think that ought to echo with people that if the finished work of Jesus is not enough, nothing will ever be enough. Nothing. It, it would not matter what the Lord could do in your life. You have simply resonated to the fact that Christ's death and resurrection is just not going to cut it for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just complete strong grounds of unbelief at that point. Um, Absolutely. And he was very, very direct in that statement towards that crowd. And I think we ought to take heed in that when we begin to think about that and what we keep demanding, you know, from the Lord, so to speak, or even from other believers, as if somehow, some way, we'll never know your salvation apart from one of these three or four things that you need to perform for us publicly and continue, like you said, to normatively perform so that we can make sure that we've checked you off as, well, they must be one of us, so to speak. So, again, very dangerous ground uh, to get on there in that. So, um, I was going to ask this question. You've touched on it already, you know, some of the gifts that are, are typically abused and falsely taught. I think you've taught on, you know, the big three there, so to speak, prophecies and tongues and things along those lines and interpretations. I think that's probably the biggest that usually get thrown out um, and miracles, you know, the healings, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think has been the fallout of all of this? If we look at the landscape of Christianity today, you know, yeah, our area, our country, even worldwide, like what do you think is the fallout of all this right now? and, And where are we because of some of this? I don't mean to offend people, but this is the way that I see it. I think we have a very um, um, I might get in trouble for saying this. <laughs> I think we have a very um, feminine driven uh, Christianity mm. um, and and what I mean by that is the fallout of concentrating on uh, supernatural gifts um, as far as very emotional, very sensational, very uh, feeling uh, gifts, is that you, you, you're you going away from the, the clear teaching and the, and the directive of Scripture, and, and then um, you, you're gravitating to a more uh, woman-driven, feminine, Type of service where where emotion is uh, is being touted as the Holy Spirit, and 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 then you're you're operating in all different types of things, and it's it, it's it's a lot of confusion. Um, so I think that is is a fallout because um, a strong church is is one that that a man leads, and there's clear biblical teaching. Um, and, and I'm not trying to put men above women. Uh, don't get me wrong on that. I'm just saying that, uh, uh that God has a, a directive right. in his word. And so I, I think if you look at a lot of the abuses, uh, a lot of the ministries that have these abuses, uh, you'll clearly see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, um, also you, you're, you're pushing people into areas of ministry and areas of of operations that they clearly don't need to be you yeah. know they don't they don't you don't need to encourage them in in certain gifts and certain uh, uh, avenues of of um of, of working you need to encourage you know if a person is a good plumber martin luther said let them plumb to the glory of christ right don't push them being a preacher where they're clearly not a preacher yeah. or, or prophesying when they're clearly, this is not what you should be doing. You should be concentrating on, uh, since when do we have to be radical? We can be yeah. common. And I think God has called a lot of us to common, which is beautiful display of, of the gospel. Yeah. So, 
I would I would agree with that. I'm, I'm I'm right there with you. I don't think you're off base on that. And anybody that comes at it without an objective to study this clearly, um, I hope they understand what you're saying there. Uh, the evidence is there. Um, you don't have to look very far. I think one of the things that I guess, from my perspective on that question, and you know, being just probably just a generation behind you, just slightly, uh, particularly in my age bracket. The biblical illiteracy mm. is an epidemic. Yes, um, it is. And it has got to the point where now it is just simply elevating, thus saith my opinion over thus saith the Lord. Or my feeling. Or pragmatism over mm-hmm. the clear revelation of Scripture. Um, and I think the fallout, like I was talking about, you know, last you, has been detrimental um, across the board, not just in the church, but in homes, um, in individual lives, in marriages, in children. Um, I don't think we properly understand the repercussions that have happened because of this. Mm-hmm. I would argue just in my short ministry, you know, just about 12 years here of, of serving the Lord in a ministry capacity as far as preaching and teaching it's probably one of the biggest, if not the most common set of questions I get. Um, it simply relates back to the fact people don't know the Scriptures, and mm-hmm. instead of leaning on the Lord, as the Bible says, they've leaned on their own understanding. Yeah. And by that, it's, what did I feel? What did I see? What did I hear? Right. Um, and sadly, what they've seen, felt, and heard has not been of the Lord. Mm-hmm. But it has been catchy. Um, mm-hmm. It is trendy. I won't argue that with anybody. Some of these guys and gals out here in this vein and movement are all-time gifted communicators. Um, Absolutely. And it would almost scare you how good some of them are. Um, and it's it's kind of like that old you know gilded idea. They've they've coated that piece of metal with some you know gold paint so to speak and you know just a little bit of filing away would show you what it really is um but i'm afraid i don't know if many people are trying to file it away and ask the real questions that need to be asked and like you said you were fortunate to come out of that and i don't mean that in the sense of like hey i'm glad i broke away from these people and i you know i don't want anything to do with them but I just think the Lord's been very kind to you in showing you the scriptures, you know, and you being able to understand them clearly now uh, by faith and and receiving that. Um, So if you're listening to this, please understand we are not sitting here grabbing stones and just rearing back and letting people of the the Pentecostal charismatic or, or whatever movement you want to talk about we're not here throwing rocks just to be throwing rocks at people. Um, we care about you. We want you to know um, that the scriptures are sufficient. Um, please know that. If nothing else, just know the scriptures are sufficient. Um, Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is sufficient. Absolutely. Um, the Holy Spirit is sufficient. Okay? Um, you do not need to add to the finished work of the Lord. Um, when you do that, you are out of bounds completely. Um, and I don't care how you do that, um, but you're out of bounds. So brother, I really appreciate you coming on. I think this is an important topic. Um, yeah, we may get some feedback who knows, (laughs) and I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I'm, I'm down for a good conversation with anybody that wants to be respectful and talk about it. Um, and I think it needs to be talked about more, to be honest with you. Um, and we may have people listening to this from, from different areas, but certainly in this area we live in, this Bible yeah. Belt, uh, this is a very important topic. And uh, maybe not in other parts of the world would this resonate, but I certainly believe people in this area uh, it'll resonate with. I don't think it was a coincidence that that was the second most sought after topic when we did this poll. Um, I yeah. really wasn't surprised by that when I saw that up there. So I was kind of glad that we were able to tackle this. Um, and, you know, just for me, um, if you guys want to email, get in touch, again, you can email us at drigw18 at gmail.com. Again, that's drigw18 at gmail.com. Uh, Pastor Stephen here at Crossroads Church. You can look those guys up online. 
Uh, they have a Facebook page. Uh, you can easily reach out to him there as well. They've got other good leadership uh, there as well. A good friend of ours uh, we mentioned before is there with you guys. Um, plenty of people to talk to, and they will not turn you away. Um, I know he'd love to communicate That's with cool. you. Um, and, you know, we're here to help. We're not here to hurt anybody. Uh, we just want the truth. You know, like we mentioned before in the podcast, we want to rightly divide, and, and that's what we're here to do. We just want to rightly divide the word of truth, help people, encourage people, uh, teach, admonish, whatever we have to do to help you along and, and just point you towards Christ. I mean, that, that's the goal here, to get you in tune with what the Lord has said in His words. So, Pastor Stephen, but I, I really appreciate you coming on. I know this wasn't exactly the most lighthearted topic we could have picked. I appreciate you being honest. Um, you know, most people probably was skated around a lot of stuff here tonight. I'm, I'm glad you didn't. Um, I think that needs to be commended, you know, and I, I appreciate what you guys are doing at Crossroads. But, uh, yeah, brother, really appreciate you being on this evening. Appreciate you having me. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, had a good time. And like I said, guys, if you haven't done so already, make sure you go on over to our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcast. Hit that subscribe button, please. Uh, you'll be updated every time we drop a new episode. And leave us a review. That helps us out as well. That also helps us get more uh, eyes on it, basically, uh, out there in the social media world so that more people can be in contact with what we're doing at Deeply Rooted. Um, you can also, again, find us on our Facebook group page. Join us there, please. All kinds of stuff going on there each day. We'll probably be dropping some new poll questions as well coming up this winter uh, to get us into the new year. Uh, we are slowly approaching on 100 episodes. I cannot believe that we're getting there. That is crazy to think about this. but um, So we're excited about this and can't wait uh, for the future of what we're doing here at Deeply Rooted. But you can also find us on our website. That's deeplyrootedpodcast.com. And uh, check out those blog posts. I'll give you a quick plug as well. Uh, Pastor Stephen has written a couple of them on there for us. They're really good. Go back and check them out. Uh, you can find him on the Sower's Pouch blog as well. So if you haven't checked that out before, they've got some good material on there that you can read up on. So lots to dive into, uh, and we can't wait to get that out there to you, new content. Tell everybody, as many as you can, share it with them, tell them about what we're doing here, and uh, hope to be a blessing to you. But again, if you need us, contact us. you got our emails there. Reach out to us through our Facebook group page as well. So until next time, listeners, we appreciate you guys and hope you all have a great week in Jesus.